Five. All right, welcome to Vault Community Office Hours. I'm Rosemary Wong, and today we have some awesome folks who are going to show some Vault kind of 1.7 related stuff. But if you have any questions, comments, please put them in the chat. Uh, as per our usual community guidelines, uh, please be respectful and please be professional. Um, with that, uh, Vishal, would you introduce yourself first? And then Clint, could you introduce yourself as well? Hi there, I'm uh, Vishal. I'm an engineer on uh, Vault. Adashi Corp, it's been uh, a long time since I'm working on Vault and it's been a fun journey. Excited to talk to you about uh, Autopilot today. Hi, my name is uh, Clint. I've been at HashiCorp for a while. I have been working on Vault for about three years now, and uh, I will be showing some things on the Terraform secret engine that we've added. So out of curiosity, do either of you have official Vault veteran badges? <laughs> I think we should, we should have it soon, I guess. Cool. I, I'm not okay. aware of what this is. I don't know. I feel like it should be a thing because you've been both you've both been working on Vault for quite a bit of time, so you know all the ins and outs by this point. <laughs> it is already a thing. I, I recently got an email that for, for veterans, the HashiCorp is doing something. <laughs> That's amazing. Something, something, something good. I mean, awesome. <laughs> all right. Uh, shall we just get started then? I guess we'll start with by showing autopilot. Michelle, can you explain a little bit of why autopilot came to be uh, and, and a little bit about integrated storage? Yeah, um, I think before uh, talking about autopilot, it's better if I give some background on what an integrated storage is and um, wh why we have autopilot today. Vault supports uh, a lot of storage backends out of the box. And uh, one of the storage backends is integrated storage. Uh, integrated storage is essentially nothing but a storage that works off of raft protocol. And uh, it's different in the sense that all the rest of the vault clusters would depend on one storage that is running separately outside of vault and vault would talk to those uh, storage backends. Uh, when it comes to raft, each node of the raft cluster will have data replicated onto themselves. So it's easier and, and faster in many, in many ways. Um, it, it works off of the raft, product, raft consensus protocols. That's how all the nodes in the cluster replicate data to themselves. And uh, if people are used to consoles raft protocol and raft autopilot, autopilot in console, it would be easier for them to understand uh, as well. And uh, one good thing is console had raft for a long time and uh, HashiCorp wanted to have the same capability in multiple other products. So they abstracted out the capability of having the raft uh, uh, work for multiple products into a library and then made it available to all the other products. Uh, and, and that's why we have uh, integrated storage and autopilot in Vault today. Having said that, uh, what's autopilot and why do we need that? Managing raft clusters is a little bit tricky in the sense that uh, raft works based on a quorum of nodes being able to talk to each other. They work based on an election between themselves. Uh, there are a couple of states where nodes can be, for example, a node can be a candidate state, a follower state, or in a leader state. Uh, candidate means that nodes are ready for elections and follower means they're just listening, getting data from the leader and leader is obviously doing all the tasks and, and shipping all the logs to all the follower nodes. Well, at any point of time um, for a cluster to work well, we need a quorum number of nodes to be alive and running, which means that it, it's sort of a democracy. Uh, a majority of nodes should always be there to be able to vote uh, to elect a leader. And when nodes go down, it's it's pretty hard on operators to manage it. And there are uh, there are a couple of things that console has tried over years to, to improve it. And eventually they landed on something called as autopilot, which essentially makes sure that when new nodes are added to the cluster, it ensures that those nodes are healthy first and then only make them as voters. 
that is one aspect of autopilot and the other one is that if there are a lot of failed nodes in the cluster and if they are voters they wouldn't be operating but they'll still have voting rights so all the other nodes will be confused expecting a vote from those nodes and uh, those nodes will not be able to vote because they are down and cleaning up of those nodes is hard that's why uh, another feature called dead server cleanup is also part of uh, autopilot and uh, another important aspect of working with integrated storage and autopilot is it's, it's hard to get a full state of the cluster in one shot because there are multiple nodes and autopilot provides a all in one api where if you, you just invoke it on any node uh, on the cluster you get a full state of information as to cluster is healthy or not if individual node is healthy or not where are they with respect to getting data from the leader and things like that um, so th that is uh, autopilot in in a nutshell but i can i'll be happy to give a demo now if um, if that's the right time yeah that'd be great um, okay. I, for those who are, so just to confirm, is the shared library that console and vault use, is that called a uh, raft-autopilot? Yes. Okay. Yes, on GitHub. It, it, is, it is open source. Okay, cool. So for those in the chat, I did paste a link to that library if you're interested in, you know, hanging out and looking at it. Uh, it is open source. So the check out the link there. And I also posted a visual, a fun visual explaining Raft in general, which is sort of the, the sort of, at least a good explanation of how it gets, con there's consensus, right? Um, so if anybody's interested, feel free to check it out. We also had an office hours on, another office hours on integrated storage too. So, um, all right, demo time? Yeah, sure. I'll share my screen. Okay, I have set up a few scripts essentially. Here, there are six scripts. You don't need to get, get into the details of each script, except that you need to know that each script will bring up a vault node in the cluster. And um, the, the first one initializes the vault leader, and then all the rest of the nodes just come up and join the, the leader node that we brought up. And the last one here, joins the cluster, but as a non-voter. I'll, I'll get to this uh, later. This is one piece. And um, let me explain all the windows here so people are not confused. The, all the uh, shells on the left spins up uh, individual nodes. So th this one will bring up one node, the second node, third node, fourth node, fifth node, and sixth node. And this is the API which most of the people who are using uh, Raft today will be aware of Vault Operator Raft List Peers API. Um, and the this is the one that we have added new Vault Operator Raft Autopilot State. This is hitting the uh, the state API of the autopilot that we have exposed. Um, let's bring up one node of Vault and start watching this output. Essentially, the script is bringing up the node. Vault is not unsealed yet. It is still in the initialization process. As soon as it is unsealed, we should be able to see the output of these two nodes, these two windows. Now that the node is uh, unsealed, the leader election is happening. And as soon as Raft finishes the leader election, there is a leader. There is only one node in the cluster, and this is the address of the node. It is a leader and it is also a voter. And uh, Raft API is also showing that the cluster is healthy. Uh, failure tolerance is zero, which means that we can't afford to lose this node. If we lose this node, we'll also lose the uh, operating ability of the vault cluster. Uh, there is only one voter in the cluster, which is Raft1, and there is only one server, and these are the details of those servers, uh, of that server. Now, to this same uh, cluster, we can add nodes in parallel. Let's say we add three nodes in parallel. We can see in this window that they have been added to the cluster, but they have been added as non-voters. And after a few, uh, after a configurable amount of time, which, is, which we call a server stabilization time, just 10 seconds at this point, if, this no, if these nodes prove to be stable for the first 10 seconds, they will be promoted as voters. Now we can see that they have been promoted as voters. 
So and, Sean, uh, out of curiosity, what is the 10 seconds? Is 10 seconds just the decision that was made for Vault specifically, or is that just something you've noticed as a trend? Uh, 10 seconds is basically based on a heuristic that console came up with um, as a server stabilization time. But if uh, for self-managed vault clusters uh, with customers, if they find that servers are taking more time to stabilize, they can actually tune that. The autopilot configuration defaults to 10 seconds at first, but uh, it need not be 10 seconds. It can be changed. Uh, since you asked, I'll actually show See, we can see that the server stabilization time is 10 seconds by default, and uh, this is this can be modified. And after 10 seconds, um, Autopilot tries to reconcile and it finds that these servers were healthy and that's why they, uh, it promoted these three nodes. Let's say I add another uh, node. I'll, I'll show that again. We can see that the server five will be added to the cluster, but it will be in non-water state. And after 10 seconds, it should become a water. Yep, we can see that it's been promoted as water. And um, at this point of time, let me just modify the configuration to enable the, we can see that the, the, the cleanup dead servers is false by default. And uh, I'm changing that by setting this flag here, clean up dead servers, I'm enabling it. And dead server last contact threshold, I'm setting it to 10 seconds, which means that if uh, uh, a console has something called a surf, which will tell the uh, console cluster if the nodes went down, if the nodes died, there is no such thing in Vault. So Vault will need some way to know if the nodes were dead. So all, all the nodes, will be sending a heartbeat to the leader node. And if leader does not get the heartbeat from any of the follower node, it will, it will uh, contact this configuration and see if the cleanup dead servers is enabled. If it's enabled and if it's 24 hours, for the, for the next 24 hours, if we don't get any, uh, if, the, if the heartbeat from the nodes is not resumed, Vault will consider that to be dead and it will remove that node from the RAF configuration. For the demo purposes, I'm setting it to 10 seconds. So if I if I basically kill any node here, within 10 seconds, if the heartbeat is not resumed, which it won't, uh, Walt will consider it to be dead and removed from the RAF configuration. We can see that not in just a bit. Let's decide like four and five. If we kill node four and five, we should see that they, they go to a left state instead of alive, and within two seconds, they'll be removed. That's really cool. Yep. Uh, so you can opt not to, I assume based on the configuration, you can opt not to clean up the dead servers, correct? Yep. Yes, I just enabled it in the configuration. As you can see, the clean up dead servers is just set to true. By default, it is false. Now it is set to true. And I changed the threshold to 10 seconds. And that's why in 10 seconds, Walt considered it to be dead and removed it. That is uh, another piece of uh, autopilot. And one last thing I want to show is, um, on the enterprise side, we can add nodes to the raft cluster that do not have the ability to vote. We call it as non-voters. And the, there, there is a neat little thing that console users also need to know. In, in console world, it's called as read replica. And for uh, naming conflicts and for other reasoning in what we couldn't name it as read replica. And we named it non-voter itself. So if these nodes join the raft cluster, they, they join the cluster for sure, they will be added as non-voter, but they will never be uh, promoted as voters. So even after 10 seconds, uh, this should remain to be a non-voting node. Let's wait for 10 seconds and see if it does it. This is the one I showed in this script. Essentially that node is doing a raft operator join to the cluster, but it is joining as a non-voter. 
this node is still a non-voter while while these two nodes have have joined the cluster as voting nodes and um, if we kill that node uh, even that will be cleaned up by autopilot non-voters will also be cleaned up now that the node is done within 10 seconds this should be marked as left and within one or two seconds they should be removed from the left cluster automatically yep that's that's all i had as part of the demo hey michelle i had a question actually um because this autopilot stuff's a little new to me what's the purpose of the non-voter joining like what what's their, what purpose does that a non-voter server serve yeah yep yeah. non-voter um, in a cluster serves as horizontal read scaling nodes so in in console you can basically have a bunch of nodes uh, that will all, all have data replicated to them and they can be configured to service read requests in in vault world even if the that, that, that it's a good question the, the reason you asked um, the uh, in vault world even if there are standby nodes standby nodes get requests but those requests are forwarded automatically to the leader so non voter does not make sense uh, out of the box in the world world but if performance standbys are enabled and then read requests are enabled in the performance standby nodes and if they are non voters horizontal scaling can be achieved that's why it's an enterprise feature okay my next part of my next question was going to be is that in line with uh, performance secondaries um and then a follow up to that is uh do non voters affect the fault tolerance number no, like, they won't because they won't because since since it's a non-voter node, it, it, even if it is alive or dead, it doesn't matter to the raft quorum. Raft quorum is only affected by the voting nodes, number of voting nodes in the cluster. The number of voting nodes in the cluster should always be more than half of the uh, number of nodes in the cluster. For example, if the cluster size is three, there should at least be two nodes running at any time. If the cluster node is five, uh, if the cluster size is five, there should at least be three nodes to be able to successfully uh, elect a leader and three voting nodes, I mean, non-voting uh, uh, nodes can be any number. It does not matter. And um, since you asked, there is another, uh, I don't know if my screen is shared yet. I'll, I'll share my screen again. Um, yeah, there, there is this configuration called min quorum set to three, which means that even if the dead server cleanup is enabled, if the nodes go dead, don't clean up servers uh, when the number of nodes in the cluster hit to three, retain at least three nodes in the cluster at any time. Uh, that is something console faced and learned the hard way where autopilot just went and killed nodes down to one. And uh, that was pretty bad. And they had added this, uh, configuration uh, field and Walt is benefiting it from the get-go. That's really neat. Uh, we actually had a question in chat. They're curious what the setup is. So are Raft 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 actual separate nodes or are they separate instances running on the same node for demo sake? Uh, they are, I actually, I have set up my ethernet ports. Uh, they loop back addresses in the, I'll share my screen again. The scripts that I have, I'm doing a if config alias for for each address. So they are separate nodes talking to um, talking to each other over the network via the via these IP addresses. So the uh, vault one is talking over one twenty seven zero zero one, and this is one twenty seven zero zero two and three four five six. They're, they're separate instances of Vault running in the same uh, machine, but it can be running anywhere, basically. Need not necessarily be in the same machine. And, it, and in practice, it, it won't be in the same machine. So as far as Vault's concerned, they're separate nodes. But if you're thinking node as in like a virtual machine or an actual machine, if they're all running on the same computer, though. Th that's possible, yeah. Yeah. Well, for, for the demo, that's how it's going. Probably yeah. not recommended production setup to have them Six yep. instances on one machine. It's not a good idea. Yep. No. Yeah. I, isn't is I wonder is HCP Vault using integrated storage? Yeah. Uh, they they have not they have they are not 
using autopilot yet because it was released for two weeks back and uh, yeah. hcp world went ga last week uh, that's not enough time for anybody to upgrade but uh, but it's it's good, good that you brought it up hashicorp uh, sorry hcp world is leveraging integrated storage by default and uh, th that's proof that integrated storage is stable enough for production use and uh, integrated storage was released in 1.4 and as a as a tech preview and it had its sweet time fixing bugs and getting stable and uh, i think we made it ga in 1.5 and we added a bunch of features um, as well onto this there are there are when autopilot was released with 1.7 it did not support running autopilot for uh, ha only clusters raft ha only clusters and that's been fixed in the next version uh, which is going to be 1.7.1 uh, folks will be able to use uh, integrated storage as raft only uh, ha only storage and autopilot will be working on the, on and that instance of uh, raft as well Interesting. Cool. Uh, we actually had a side comment. Uh, and I'd, in my simple worldview, non-voters can help vault burst and do things like batch transit jobs and then disappear. Non-voters as containers, maybe. Is that a fair assessment on non-voters? Oh, I, I honestly don't know. I didn't get that comment, so I don't want to comment on that. <laughs> it's fine. I, there, I guess there are some things that we have yet to explore with non-voters and what to do with them. Um, but if anybody has any ideas in the community, uh, definitely reach out. We'd love to hear But, but non-voters in Oasis makes no sense. Uh, one, you cannot do it. Two, it doesn't help because all the standby notes will uh, anyways forward and the requests to the leader so that they are of no help. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thinking more on that too, like a container would you would want to start up quickly but in an integrated storage environment, like it's going to start up and then it's going to have to replicate all of the data from the main cluster to get going, right? I assume, Michelle. Come again, Clint. I was saying, uh, as as a uh, a non-voter boots up, it has to get all its data from the primary to begin with, or from the leader. So if if your vault is of significant size, like it took could take a little bit. Do we? Does it use snapshots to carry over, like? A chunk of data first and then like replay yeah, wall yeah. logs on top yeah yeah, okay. yeah it, it depends on how big the vault's data is uh, before um, any new nodes become operational if uh, th the way it works is that um raft sets up tls mutual communication between nodes uh, and, and they speak with the cluster port of vault and when the new nodes are joined it's it's hard to um, establish authentication with them. So we have come up with a way of challenge response uh, mechanism wherein a new node will, will hit the leader nodes challenge API over the API port, which is uh, basically the client's address to talk to Walt, and then say, hey, I'm a new node, uh, give me a challenge so I prove my authentication to you. And the leader node essentially creates a UUID, encrypts it with uh, its uh, encrypts it and sends it to the new node that's being joined. And since these two nodes are supposed to be part of the same cluster, they will use the same seal configuration, whether it's Shamir or auto seal. And if the same seal is shared between the two nodes, they should be able to use the unseal keys and, and decrypt that secret and establishing uh, authenticity to the leader node. And that's when this will be, uh, the, the new node will be joining the uh, the cluster and after the new node joins the communication over the api address will be api sorry the api address will be stopped and the communication with the cluster port will begin and at that point of time um, the leader node sends a raft snapshot to the new node and that snapshot will be installed and if the snapshot is too big it takes a while before the new non-voter or voter becomes operational. Awesome. If there are any other questions that anybody has about integrated storage, autopilot, or anything else, uh, drop it in the chat. And since we're coming up on sort of the halfway mark, let's uh, transition to the 
other part of, of Vault 1.7, uh, which was released, which includes ecosystem related items. Um, and I think Clint has a demo and explanation of a new secrets engine. Yeah, so uh, for uh, Vault 1.7, we included a new secret engine to manage uh, tokens for Terraform, the actual uh, uh, Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise, whichever one you may be using. So with the new secret engine, you can define um, three types of roles, and I'll get to those in a minute, and you can dynamically generate access tokens for talking and working with Terraform Cloud. So uh, I will start by sharing my screen. And uh, let's see. Uh, actually, I'm going to share. Hold on. I was figuring out how to do this. Where'd it go? OK. So uh, I'm using HCP Vault, of course, because it just went GA and it's wonderful. And you should try it out sometime. And I have a small Vault cluster here. I currently have uh, no secrets going on yet. Um, and I'm going to get to these tokens in a minute, but this is my, uh, Terraform, uh, cloud set up right now. So to get going, um, you see, we have none of the secrets we want. So we're going to enable it. Vault secrets, enable Terraform. And I need to spell it right. Uh, we're seeing a browser. Did you want to share? Ah, I didn't share. I didn't change it. Well, then you didn't. Then I did spell it right, and you all just didn't see that part. <laughs> we saw nothing. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so enable the Terraform secret engines. So vault secrets list. Right. So we'd see it there. So in order to um, configure this, we do need to give it an API token. So it's it's comparable to. Uh, any other secret engine where you have to give it a higher enough privileged access token to be able to generate other access tokens. So I'm using a, a personal access token that has permissions. The vault, uh, right, form config. And I believe that does it. I have uh, some environment variables already set up. So um, after that, I want to do vault, right, terraform, role org and the organization is HashiCorp vault testing. So I'll do that and vault read Terraform. So some things to point out here. One, uh, the role name is just org. I'm just using that internally in vault. The organization is HashiCorp vault testing and you'll notice the TTLs are zero. So the reason for that is the Terraform cloud platform has three different levels of, of user account, basically. They have organizations, they have teams, and they have users. Organizations and teams are only allowed a single API token uh, at one time um, between each other, right? So organization can have one and a team can have one. Um, generate a new API token for either of those will revoke the old one. So for this secret engine, we've made a uh, team and organization token or roles uh, special in that they do not have leases associated with those tokens. Um, you can just generate the API token and then you have it, it's up to you to rotate it yourself later. Now, in order to know what the token is, when you first write the Terraform role for an organization or a team, uh, in the back end, we actually generate a new token for you because we have no way of knowing if there was an existing token, what it is. So uh, flipping back to the web browser, I'll go to the right tab, and we look at the organization, we can now see that there is a token here generated. Um, and I can read that, vault read terraform grids org. So there's that token, and I'm going to erase that in a minute. And if you read it multiple times, you get the same token over and over until it gets rotated. Um, well, am I still on the browser? Yep, still on the browser. And OK, so this part I did not rehearse. So here, uh, now you can see me reading the same token uh, over and over and over. And the token stays the same. So now really quickly, I'm just gonna go over and uh, I did not switch sharing. Okay, so I went ahead and revoked that token manually on the web just to be safe. So that's managing an organization token. Uh, user tokens are also a little bit different 
from some of the traditional secret engines in that uh, the Terraform Cloud API does not allow you to dynamically create new users. So what it does allow you to do is create multiple access tokens. So for our secret engine, what we've done is um, you can create a role that is a user type. You give it a user ID in the role creation. And whenever you generate tokens, you generate a new API token for that account, not a new user, but a new API token. And those API tokens do have leases associated with them. Um, so to demonstrate that, what we did um, when we wanted to release a secret engine is we wanted to make sure we included a Terraform provider resources for this, uh, for, for this new secret engine. So in parallel, we, uh, another engineer worked on the Terraform side of this. So now we actually have Terraform resources to manage these things. So I will show you some of that. Um, I already have some of this set up in my cluster. So I don't have all the things here in the Terraform configuration but uh, I do have some basics. So the background is Terraform, so that's why that part's hard-coded. So I'm going to change that. And I have some Terraform variables already in uh, my environment. So we're gonna create a user and uh, it's going to manage a, well, I'm sorry, we're not creating a user. We're going to manage a specific user that is already defined. Uh, I'll go over there. So here you see we've got a single API token that I'm actually using for something else. Um, and we're going to add tokens here. I'm getting better at this switching back and forth thing. Okay, so Terraform in it. Terraform plan. So you can see in the plan, we're going to create a, well, we're gonna create a user resource, but it's not creating a, a dynamic user, so. I'll apply that. Let me do auto approve because it's the demo. So uh, I've now created the rule, the role, but I have not created any tokens for it. So I can do um, in here, back in the Terraform configuration. So um, what? Okay. Another resource is uh, secret credentials. Um, in the past, these have been data sources, uh, but Terraform, I believe version 0 0.13 changed the way data sources work. So data for sources are actually read during a plan. So um, what that would do is during a read that would actually generate credentials that never end up getting used because the plan would actually redo it. So we, for this resource, we've actually changed it as a resource. Um, so it will only be, the token will only be created at a plan, uh, apply time. So I'm going to, I'm not going to do those things right now. Um, well, actually, I can. And I just have two outfits for the token and for the lease. Um, I'm going to remove the token. Well, it's only got a. We'll do a uh, 10 second TTL. So, Terraform plan. We see, okay. Um, we're going to create the token. And the role is going to actually be modified because I wanted to uh, make that 10 seconds. And hold on, I want to make sure I did something right. Yeah, okay. So Terraform, apply, auto approve. All right, so there's our token. I wanted to do this better. That's an old token. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Of course, it's an old token. Don't worry about that. Everyone, these tokens are being displayed for demo purposes only. Yes. <laughs> Don't share tokens. Uh, see, okay. So I didn't get to it in time. It actually got revoked. So uh, I was trying to I was trying to show that I could curl the API and get my username out. But so um, because it got revoked, if I do Terraform plan again, it wants to uh, recreate it. So the lease is going to get redone and the Terraform token is going to get done because when we refresh the user token resource, it does a lookup on the lease ID and it found that it already expired. So I can do, um, let's make that 20 and let's uh, actually remove the token value so I can demonstrate this better. So Terraform plan, we're gonna make this new token. Fly, wonderful, it has a lease ID. And I will switch back to this and I'll refresh my there. So now I see I've got a 
token that was created dynamically. And I bumped it to 20 seconds because I didn't think I'd be able to switch fast enough. But um, see if I can do this. It's a race against time. It is. <laughs> Lease. Let's see if that's, yeah, so that's invalid lease now. Uh, and refresh, and that should be gone. There you go. It has been revoked. Um, okay, I'm, I don't remember what I'm sharing anymore. Uh, Still showing the, the web. Browser. Okay, so yeah. I, I actually, okay, I went to my terminal and I uh, did a lease lookup, but by then it had already been expired. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> fast, fast time to live. Uh, there's actually a question about the number of user access tokens. So team and organization tokens can only be created one at a time, mm -hmm. but the user access tokens, does Terraform Cloud or Enterprise put a, a limit on how many you can create? Uh, so the documentation says, and I, I don't remember if it was in quotes or if I've been adding quotes, the documentation says unlimited. I have not stressed that and um, I have not, asked uh, any Terraform Cloud engineers to clarify what unlimited means, but they say unlimited. So basically, as long as you're using Vault Secrets Engine to rotate your tokens, you really maybe only need one at a time, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, limited ones or, or, yeah. or tokens uh, created for very specific purposes. But uh, what this ends up being is you end up kind of creating uh, Terraform users that are almost like service account things. But I actually don't know the billing implications of that. I don't know how Terraform Cloud does those things. So. Yeah. Um, uh, something... that... Oh, I was just saying that's oh. that's all the demo I had. Oh, okay, awesome. Um, there's a, I guess a general question I think about Secrets Engine development. Um, there are not too many people who ask direct development questions, but it's something interesting because I learned this during this process, right? Um, and so Terraform Cloud works, the user and organization, to, not user, sorry, the team and organization tokens issue one at a time. It's a very specific way that the secrets, I guess, work. Um, and so part of the decision was to basically not put leases in vault on that. Is that a good practice? Is that something that's typical if your tokens or the, the target secrets engine that you're trying to create doesn't have the, the most perfect ability to rotate every token? Um, is it a common practice to do like no lease? Well, uh, I would say th the decision to do it that way was not done lightly. There was a lot of discussion about it. Um, for Terraform specifically, what we wanted to avoid was tokens being revoked without any, because it was a shared token, we were afraid of just revoking it, not knowing how many people could be using it. Um, but perhaps we should have erred on the side of, of caution there and, and actually associated leases with it. Another option would be to um, make them like static accounts. Um, the, the database secret engine has a static account uh, system where assuming a entity already exists, uh, Terraform, or Terraform, Vault will periodically rotate the credential for that. And so you could request credentials and it would return the same credential within that that period of time, and then you know the lease information would say you know you have like one minute left, and then it would automatically um, actively rotate the token in the background as opposed to like passively where like it just rotates it the next time it requests if it's past the TTL. There has been a feature request um, to consider that on the secret engine, and we are considering it right now, making them actually static uh, uh, accounts in uh, static roles and actually actively rotating them. As far as a general practice, I would say no. I would say it's it's discouraged unless you we kind of felt like we kind of had to, um, because in general, like secret engines, you you want the dynamic short term uh, ephemeral credentials that are going to go away. You don't want them laying around for a long time. So um, I have a hunch we're going to change the Oregon team tokens to be different, to be static tokens that that get rotated periodically. Um, so in general, no, I would I would favor uh, least tokens um, unless you absolutely have to do it the other way. Yeah, um, and something that was interesting during the initial development, user tokens were not in existence. <laughs> there was no, or at least the API for user tokens was not uh, was not Correct. there. So can you speak a little bit about sort of the development process to get the user tokens into the user token API exposed, 
uh, and then ultimately so that you could write the secrets engine for it? Uh, yes. Um, as a secret engine developer, I would say I cheated because I work at HashiCorp and I was able to, uh, I, I looked at some Terraform cloud code and found out who kind of owned that API a little bit. And then I, I messaged them privately and I said, why is there no user API? And they said, I don't know. And then, and then we discussed it briefly and uh, they decided to add it for me. And then um, uh, I actually went and added the, uh, we have a Go library for talking to Terraform cloud. And I, uh, I just added it to that library. And then that engineer was kind enough to review and merge it quickly. And uh, so then we had it. So, um, you know, I, I asked them like, why wasn't it there? And they said, well, it just hadn't actually been a need to date. It wasn't necessarily that they intentionally omitted it. It was kind of a, a time and it just never happened. So uh, I was able to add that to the, the library um, fairly quickly, so. But again, I kind of cheated because I work here and, and I knew people and I was able to kind of talk to them directly. Yeah, but I think it's it's something that kind of demonstrates there's the, if you don't have a, if you are working with, if you're running your own secrets engine and you're working with an API that's not completely ideal, um, you do have to either fix some parts of the API in some way, shape or form, or do something within your secrets engine that may not be the best practice. Uh, to accommodate for the behavior. And it was something that I had to learn because when I initially sort of drafted this for my own use, uh, you know, I had a very specific pattern and very specific way of working. Yeah. Um, it was really cool to see this progress through discussion, internal discussions and, sorry, someone's doing construction work there, uh, and, and learn about some of the different ways to consider constructing a secrets engine based on the behaviors of the API. So it's been, it was a really interesting thing. Well, I was hoping you would give yourself more credit here because <laughs> I, 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 Rosemary was the original author of this engine and she wrote it kind of like as a proof of concept, right? Or, or something you needed. Yeah, I, I yeah. needed it because I was basically we had a bunch of labs and I was so tired of uh, <laughs> of rotating the tokens all the time and deleting the mm -hmm. org and team ones because uh, that was how the lab ran. So I was just like, you know, what? I'm going to write a secrets engine, connect it to a vault server because I'm just, you know, and run it custom because I'm just really tired yeah. of it. Um, and uh, it, you know, it ended up turning, it ended up working out. But um, when I first designed it, I was, I had no idea what I was doing. I had never, I'd written Terraform providers, mm -hmm. but I had not written vault plugins. And um, you know, it was pretty neat to learn to learn about it too. Yeah, yeah. Well, when it came to our side, they're like, well, we want to do this. And someone's like, oh, I think Rosemary has prior art or something. I was like, oh, and I looked at it and I was like, all right, well, this is like mostly done. So let's run with this. Um, and then, yeah, the other parts that, that I had to do was just work on the, the user stuff um, and work with the Terraform cloud team to kind of get that out. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, again, so if you, if you do want to learn more about the secrets engine process, maybe you know, how to develop it. We, we did have a, a community office hours, but if anybody's interested in another one again and has more specific questions, do let us know. Uh, because it's a fascinating it, and it, it, you know, how much you have to think about the behavior of the upstream API is really, I mean, it's really interesting and it changes how your secrets engine behaves too. Uh, I imagine it's similar for auth methods as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. One last question for the secrets engine. It is called the Terraform cloud secrets engine, but does it work for Terraform enterprise as well? Uh, yes, it does. Um... I, I talked to, I think, the same engineer asking about this, and um, the only, the API, sh and I say should be identical, the only differences that could happen is that if you are running Terraform Enterprise privately, and you could be possibly a few versions behind, that your API could uh, maybe not have a feature or two, but um, I believe they should all have the user support for user API stuff. Uh, the majority of the work I had to do to get the user API done was actually add it to the library. The backend API kind of already existed, but I don't think it was like turned on, I, I forget. Um, so other than that, yes, they should be the same. And when you, conf you, when you configure, I didn't, I didn't show this because I used the defaults. The default, when you configure the secret engine, the default uh, API addresses uh, app.terraform.io or API, one of those. 
Um, but you can configure the API address. So if your Vault cluster has access to a Terraform Enterprise instance, you just have to give it the Terraform, inter and the Terraform Enterprise's API address, and it should work the same. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I think there's a construct. All right. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up. I don't see as many questions coming in through chat, uh, but Clint and Vishal, thank you so much for joining us today and for asking your own questions and for showing us some awesome features um, and some really, at least discussing some interesting background in terms of architecture and how some of these uh, features work. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can always reach out to us on Office Hours. Uh, I believe we'll have another one. KubeCon EU is happening next month, so we'll have a Kubernetes-specific one. Uh, we also have a couple going on this week. We have Azure Providers for Terraform on Thursday uh, and Terraform Plugin SDK on Thursday as well. So definitely check out some of the Terraform ones this week. Um, and as uh, Vishal and Clint ben mentioned, HCP Vault is generally available. If you're interested in trying it, uh, I'll drop a link in the chat. Um, do check it out. And if there's anything that uh, you have feedback on or you're interested in learning more, uh, definitely keep in touch. Glad it's only construction that is causing the noise. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, and then with that, I guess we'll conclude for today. Um, thank you so much for the two of you for being uh, for being available and for answering so many of our questions. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me too. Thanks, Rosemary. Do I leave? I don't know what to do. <laughs>